Good morning. My name is Bruce Willard. I'm uh, the uh, moderator for Mastery Men's Club. And this morning we're continuing our guest speaker series, which we've been sponsoring uh, because we've not been able to hold any live meetings yet this year due to the pandemic. Uh, this today, during the course of this year, we've had a number of people from the town to, who have spoken to us, the town manager, the town clerk, the superintendent of schools, the fire and rescue chief. So we're kind of continuing in that uh, that tradition. We very much wanted to have Andrew come to us because of his extensive experience in town government, uh, five terms uh, as a board of selectmen, currently the chair of that board, but we're also very interested in his environmental background where he is currently uh, the, uh, you're currently, which one now? I'm sorry, please. Oh, right now I'm, in, I'm the executive director of the Association of Preserve Cape Cod. Okay, yeah, okay, but right here, yeah. and before that, but he's been involved with it for about 20 to 30 years maybe Yeah. It, environmental issues. Yeah. And we who live on Cape Cod are very interested in environmental issues. Uh, we love Cape Cod. We want to try to preserve and protect Cape Cod as well. So we welcome Andrew this morning. Andrew, we've got Luke. Thank you. Thank you. So it's nice to appreciate the opportunity to talk to you and those out there on TV land. Um, and so we'll, you know, cover issues of general government, but in particular, I want to start off with uh, discussing a little bit what we have coming up to town meeting. Um, and in addition to sort of the things we need for general government purposes, which is typical. Uh, we have a series of questions before the voters, both at town meeting and on May 3rd, and then also um, June 8th at the ballot that mark a sort of generational opportunity for the town of Mashpee to embark on a, a future of clean water and reverse the trends that we've seen over, certainly at least my lifetime, um, and many decades, the degradation of our surface water quality uh, in our estuaries, in particular Papanasset Bay and Wakoit Bay. So the town has been working for literally 35 years to uh, both first understand what was happening in our bays, um, why there was a decline in water quality, why we lost the real grass, why we lost our native shellfish populations, why the bottoms were transitioning from hard sand that was pleasant to walk in uh, to soft and mucky, which is unpleasant to walk in, why we were getting fish kills in the early parts of the 2000s, um, and why we were seeing aesthetic decreases in the quality of the water uh, because of you know, algae growth and, um, and, and low visibility. And what we determined, much like every other part of Cape Cod, is that the reason those things were happening because we relied on septic systems as a primary source of, of treating our wastewater. And the septic systems were designed to function to protect the public health from bacteria, but did nothing to remove nutrients from the effluent, from uh, the treated wastewater that comes through the septic system and then leaches down to the groundwater. And once it hits the groundwater, it inevitably moves towards the nearest surface water um, and brings with it all the nutrients that are in human waste and basically provide food source for uh, naturally occurring algae that allowed it to outcompete other sources or other uh, environmental uh, species that were beneficial and cause a cascading series of problems that have resulted in um, basically the water quality of our estuaries crashing, the ecological value of those resources crashing, and that threatens everything about quality of life in the town of Ashby, whether it's property values, whether it's recreational values, whether it's our destination as a uh, summer vacation spot, all of those things are predicated on quality of the water. And so now that we understand the problem, we spent the last 10, 15 years coming up with a solution to the problem. And what the solution is, it has two phases. One is well, and it's all based on the notion that we have to uh, reduce the amount of nitrogen, reduce the uh, nutrients that are ending up in our waters. Um, and there's two ways we've chosen to do that. One that we've already started is to invest in large scale aquaculture. The town has been a leader for the last five or six years in using um, shellfish, particularly oysters and quahogs, as that we propagate and release into the wild 
as a uh, source of uptake of the nitrogen. So the, they, as filter feeders, clams and, and oysters filter, take the water in, they consume the algae, use it for food to grow. That algae has in it the nitrogen. And so when those, they become little sinks for that nitrogen. Um, and then when they're harvested, either by a residential permit holder or a commercial person, all that nitrogen comes out of the water body with the clam or the oyster. And so that's one way that we've adopted to address that, uh, the problems that we're seeing in the water quality. The reality is, though, that as effective as oysters and quahogs seem to be in bringing down a chunk of the nitrogen, they are not capable of doing the entire job. And therefore, the second part of our program that is before town voters uh, for the first time on Monday the 3rd is the authorization to construct a wastewater treatment facility and an initial round of sewering. And it is only through advanced wastewater treatment and the collection of wastewater uh, from homes and the replacement, therefore, of those septic systems as the primary source of their treatment. That's the only way we're going to reach water quality standards and see our bays and estuaries restore themselves to the health that draw, drew everybody to Mashpee. So the town has developed um, a five-phase wastewater management program. Each phase is a five-year period. We're asking the voters to approve phase one right now. Um, phase one and phase two will most certainly be necessary. Phases three, four, and five are conditional. And they are conditional upon two factors. How well does the natural system respond to the shellfish piece? You know, we have a pretty good feel for how effective they're going to be. We've seen some encouraging results that, in fact, maybe they're a little more effective than our estimates thought. And if that's the case, and the second condition is met, that our waters begin to respond to the management intervention that we're taking, and we see better water quality, we can stop at any phase. So the expectation and hope is that we will not have to implement all five phases. All five phases exist because if the intervention on the shellfish side fails, we need a solution in our back pocket. The hope and expectation and evidence thus far seems to indicate that we will not need to do that. Um, so we hope not to have to go to phases three, four, and five. We do have to start and we do have to do phase one. So what is phase one? Phase one is the only thing in front of the voters right now. A vote on phase one does not precondition or preordain um, adoption of phases two, three, four, and five. Each time we propose to move in phase forward, we'll go through the process we're going through now, which is to ask specific permission from town meeting. So people that are concerned that if I vote for phase one, then it's the whole program, that's not true. You're being asked to do one thing and one thing only. That is, on question six, it authorizes a town to borrow and construct a wastewater treatment facility at the transfer station site off of Asher's Path, you know, just behind Route 28, sandwiched around Meeting House Road. Um, the treatment plant is a state-of-the-art advanced wastewater treatment facility. It has been designed both to effectively and cheaply remove nitrogen and other contaminants from our waste stream, uh, but it's also been designed to be sensitive to the surrounding neighborhood. And by that I mean, we cited it in a way that um, there is no less than 150 feet of vegetated buffer between the facility and the property line. The state requirement is 50 feet, our minimum is 150 feet. In many instances, we're 200 feet or more. The treatment process will happen underground in concrete tanks on top of which sits the treatment building. That treatment building is under negative pressure. And the purpose for that is to prevent any untreated air within the treatment works from escaping into the surrounding neighborhood. We have a two-stage physical uh, process to remove any odors. So there's two physical filtration processes that air goes through before it's discharged into the atmosphere. There is no publicly owned treatment facility on Cape Cod that uses more than one of these. 
So we are doubling what is existing on Cape Cod. So we have a great deal of confidence that it will not create odor issues. Um, since all the treatment works are inside, noise should be minimal. Um, and we're going to be landscaping it, fencing it in a way that, um, that makes it uh, as intrusive as, as possible to the surrounding neighborhood. Um, the second part of phase one, this vote, would be to authorize the construction of collection systems, sewers. And the area that's going to be sewered is the area immediately adjacent to and around the transfer station, across 28 <coughs> down Mashby Neck Road, about halfway down. Mashby Road on one side, Mashby Neck Road on the other, that residential swath largely uh, between the two. That is the first phase of this treatment works. Um, it's a $54 million spending authorization. Um, and the town has been very aggressive and creative in developing a finance plan. So the authorization of this project of $54 million will not require an increase in anyone's taxes beyond what's already authorized. And the way we are doing that is four major elements to our financing plan. We're going to be um, and have qualified for a low interest loan from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts with something called the Clean Water Trust. Clean Water Trust is an um, entity at the state level that provides municipalities with low and no cost interest financing for water and wastewater facilities. Um, the, tr the Clean Water Trust in addition to providing the loans, provides uh, some, a grant that comes in the form of principal forgiveness. Mashpee qualifies for $1.8 million in principal forgiveness because of the formula that they use. So if you start at $54 million, 1.8 of it comes right off the top because the state's going to pay that. Um, the town also qualified for uh, an additional grant from something called the Cape and Islands Water Protection Trust Fund which was created in 2018, is funded by a surcharge on short-term rental stays on Cape Cod. And that trust, in its initial action uh, two weeks ago, awarded $71 million to eight towns. Mashpee received $13 million. That comes off the top. Um, in addition, <clears throat> so we're, we're constructing a $54 million facility about 15 of that 54 million is being paid for through grants. In addition, with the passage of question eight on the town meeting warrant, the town will qualify for a reduction in its interest rate from 2%, which is the base case that the state offers municipalities through this program, to a 0% loan. Uh, the 0% loan, that differential between the 2% uh, means we will forego $17 million in interest payments. So, you take that and then you add to it the uh, fact that the town set aside by town meeting vote last year 75 percent of the receipts that we get from hotel motel short-term rental stay tax so people who come to stay in mashby pay a tax to the state and to the local government uh, as part of their rental fee mashby set that aside for wastewater purposes we'll be taking that money out over the life of the loan, that will account for about $22 million in debt service payments. That is non-tax, uh, property tax based. So if you are an average rental or average, average taxpayer in, Massachusetts, in Mashpee and you don't rent a home, pay to rent somebody else's home, pay to rent a hotel in Mashpee, all that $22 million comes from somebody who is coming into the town, not out of your pocket. We love that. Um, <laughs> The other thing that the town did again in 2020 was create something called a Water Infrastructure Investment Fund, a WIF. The town reduced by town meeting vote and then ratified at the ballot last fall a 2% charge for water infrastructure. And at the time we did that, we reduced our 3% charge for the Community Preservation Committee down to 2%. So we had a two and a two. That authorized water infrastructure fund, which goes into effect on July 1, regardless of this vote. It's, in, it's programmed to be in place 
will begin to show up on people's tax bill. That will generate about $27 million in debt service over the life of this projected loan. So if you add up the $22 million from, trust fund, uh, from the uh, local revenue, the $27 million from the WIF, the 15, uh, $13 million in principal forgiveness, the $1.8 million in principal forgiveness, and the zero interest loan, we actually have more revenue coming from all those sources than it actually costs to service the debt on this project. Wow. So it will not require any increase in taxes to anyone. So it's a unique situation to put forward a capital infrastructure project of this scale and scope. It's the biggest thing we've ever done as a community and have it not require any tax increase from our residents. Um, so question six, let's how that happen. Question, or Article 6. Article 6 would be the vote to authorize that debt and authorize the project to proceed. Article 6 is contingent upon a second vote, which would occur on Saturday, May 8th, at part of the annual election ballot, paper ballot, uh, held at the Quashan School between 7 in the morning and 8 at night, and for which you can obtain an early voting application from the town clerk on the website uh, or by visiting town hall. Uh, that would allow you to vote by mail should you not be available on the 8th or choose not to participate uh, in person at that event. That authorizes a debt exclusion that makes Article 6 happen. And the reason we're doing that is not a typical debt exclusion. So if you think back to, I don't know, the most recent one we did, uh, or a recent one we did was, for example, the uh, town share of the uh, uh, technical high school uh, construction costs. We voted a certain amount in, we did a debt exclusion, that resulted in an incremental increase in people's taxes. What we're doing in this instance is not that. We are mechanically moving the debt of 54 million outside of our levy limit for two reasons. It preserves debt capacity for future capital projects. We want to do a road bond, we want to fix something, we need to, you know, borrow some money. To, to do a small capital infrastructure project. If we don't move this debt outside of our limit, it will consume all of our debt capacity. So handcuff the town and its ability to issue debt in the future. Um, and the second thing, because that would happen, it would jeopardize our AAA, tax, our AAA credit rating. So the idea here is, and on recommendation of our bond council, we move this $54 million debt authorization outside of our levy limit so that we don't consume all of our debt capacity, but because we have other revenue that's already identified that will fund the debt service on this, it will not result in an increase in taxes. So it's a fundamentally different debt exclusion question than the people of Mashpee have ever been asked to approve before. And it's mechanical, um, and it won't result in an increase in anybody's taxes. Um, I wish we didn't have to do it, but the lawyers say we need to do it, so we're going to do it. Um, so Article 6 and Question 1 are attached to the hip. If either one of those fails to pass, the project does not proceed. Okay? There are two more articles on town meeting warrant to consider. One is Article 7, uh, which we, as a Board of Selectmen, voted to recommend to be indefinitely postponed on Monday night. We were looking to take a little piece of land um, that was in conservation. We needed a pump station location. It got complicated. We pulled back. Uh, we have another solution in mind for a pump station that will not require significant re-engineering the system. We don't need to do it. We're not going to do it. Um, so sec Article 7 will be recommended for indefinite postponement. Article 8 is um, a bylaw that basically it, it adheres to the state requirement that you have some reasonable limit on new connections to the wastewater treatment system in order to qualify for the zero interest loan. So Article 8 says basically that whatever you were entitled to pre-sewering for a number of bedrooms in your home, you can have as part of the sewer system. It doesn't actually reduce anybody's access to wastewater treatment. It simply puts a cap on that says before sewering and after sewering, it's the same authorized amount of wastewater flow. And in fact, if you have a small property with a small house that is restricted because of Title V, the septic rules, 
you know, maybe you wanted to have, you got a two bedroom house and your lot was too small or your soils weren't very good and you couldn't get a, uh, an extra bedroom approved because your septic system couldn't handle it, you're entitled under this bylaw to the flow that would be needed to service four bedrooms. So it actually, for smaller homes that are restricted, it provides some uh, expansion of their development capacity, not a reduction. Um, this is a requirement to go from, seven, from the 2% interest to the 0% interest. Town of Falmouth adopted the exact same bylaw, and because there is no pride in authorship, basically it went through and changed, or town council went through and changed Town of Falmouth to Town of Mashby, and they changed the numbering so it actually matches our code. So it's the same model bylaw that Falmouth used. It's the same model bylaw that Falmouth used to get access to the zero interest financing from the state for a project of their own. Um, and it will not meaningfully change the reality that people uh, understood to be controlling their property development when they bought their house. Um, the state requires it because they want to ensure if they're paying that 2% interest premium for the town, that it's being used to solve the using the capacity within the system to solve the problem, not to generate a whole nother round of growth, which can then overwhelm the solution that you were seeking to implement in the first place and leave you no further ahead than you were. So, as I said earlier, passage of question eight brings us from, article eight brings us from a 2% loan to a 0% loan. It's a $17 million question. You can say no, the project will proceed, but we'll pay $17 million more in interest. And that whole financial model that I just told you about not requiring any increase in taxes, that will probably no longer be true. So if the town meeting chooses to tax itself $17 million for no particular perceptible change in value of the project, we can, it makes no sense. So we're hopeful that if question six proceeds, that question eight will also proceed as a companion. Question six, or Article six, requires a two-thirds majority because it's a borrowing authorization. Article eight, because it's just a general bylaw, only requires a majority. So I think if one passes, it's fairly likely that the other will pass. Um, the key to this whole conversation, though, is if you think clean water is important, you use the water resources of the, of the community, you accept the fact that clean water resources are a reason why this is a worthwhile place to live. You recognize a connection between your property value and living in a community that has a vibrant economy because it's based on clean water. If you want to pass your home down to your children as a matter of passing wealth down to your community, if you're planning on selling your home so that you can move into some other type of living situation as you age, if you have any interest in the value of your property staying high, um, this set of questions is essential to the long-term preservation of the property value and your economic investment in your community. Whether you're an ardent environmentalist like I am, or a property developer, or just an average person who, for whom their home is their single most valuable asset that they'll ever have, it's all dependent upon clean water because that's what drives the economy of Mashpee, that's what drives the economy of Cape Cod. Um, so if you buy all that, or if you just think it's a good idea because you want to be able to walk in the water and see your feet, um, you got to come to town meeting on Monday. You may listen to this and say, that makes perfect sense, of course it's going to pass. Well, you know, if you choose to let someone else do it for you, they might think the same thing you did, and all of a sudden, they don't show. And I guarantee you, there will be a certain number of people who are coming to vote no on these questions. Can I explain to you why? No, but I know they exist. And because it's a two-thirds majority required, for every no vote, you need two people to show up to offset that no vote. So if you think this is a good idea, you want it to happen, you can't imagine it not happening, you have to show up Monday night and vote. It's that simple. Um, you know, the only elect the elections you most likely lose are the ones you think you're going to win. Because you get lazy, you get complacent, you let somebody else do the work for you. We have done our job, I believe, as a Board of Selectmen, to put together a sensible plan that's scaled to the community, that can be absorbed and managed by the community and the finances of the community, 
we can't make this happen without active voter participation. We have done our job bringing this to you. You then have to say yes. And if you don't say yes, it won't proceed. Um, that doesn't mean it won't happen. And what I mean by that is there are third party actors out there who are actively inv involved in investigating litigation that would compel the town to move forward with a project like this. Here's the difference. If we proceed as we proposed, we are in control of our destiny, we're in control of the pace, we're in position to manage the finances. If we get litigated and lose, the judge is in charge. And the judge will do what judges do, which is put you on a schedule to get you back into compliance. That schedule may not comport with what's in the best interest of the community. Fine. The other kicker is, um, if you're under an enforcement order, a judicial order, you become disqualified for the zero interest loan. So let's say we say no at town meeting. We go take it to court. We bring the same project back to you in the fall. Say, we got to do this because the judge said we have to. The exact same project cost $17 million more because we lost access to the zero interest financing because rather than doing this on a voluntary basis in order to achieve the requirements of the law, we'll be compelled to by an enforcement action or a judicial order, and that kicks us out of getting the benefit of that zero interest reduction. We will do this project. Um, you can choose to make it as cost effective as possible as a community or have it imposed on you at a higher price. Again, it makes no rational sense not to proceed with this project in this form as it was presented to us. So two key dates, May 3rd, town meeting. It's outdoors. It's outdoors to provide the maximum amount of uh, COVID prevention as possible. Rather than aesthetic feel and back. Excuse me? Did we, it'll be right, the aesthetic feel and back. Yes, here. you go to the high school, the high school, middle school as normal. Uh, you'll be directed back to the fields. We have a large capacity tent. We'll have you know speakers. Hopefully we'll have a nice evening. Um, but you know, we've done this in a way to maximize people's comfort level with being able to be participating in town government. Because I heard from a lot of people back in the spring and the fall last year when we proceeded with a socially distant indoor town meeting that I thought went about as well as it could have, uh, that a lot of people were concerned about their well-being and were not willing to take the risk of coming to town meeting and felt disenfranchised. And so we as a group have decided to, to move it outdoors for the first time. A number of our communities elsewhere on the Cape chose to do the same thing last year. It worked pretty well. Some went to tents. Town of Orleans went to the Orleans Nosset Beach parking lot and broadcast over the radio in people's cars and gave them electronic clickers to count. Um, so there's a lot of different ways to do this. We've taken the steps that we think we needed to to provide people the opportunity to safely participate. Um, and then you need to vote on the 8th. And as I said, you can do it in person. You can do it remotely by, by mail. State law does not allow Massachusetts towns that have an open form of town meeting like we do to allow people to participate remotely. I've heard that a lot. Why don't you guys let us do it online? Why can't we? What, you know, no lack of number of permutations on what people thought was a good idea. We can't. Would we if we could? Probably. We're not allowed to. Town of Falmouth has a representative town meeting where not every person is, you know, you elect representatives, they are participants. State law allows those to be held remotely. But Mashpee, being an open form of town government, does not have the ability and was not granted the ability under the governor's emergency authorities um, to conduct our business that way. So we are working within the confines of the law as we are presented it to come up with a way to allow people to participate as openly and quickly as possible. We've also grouped together the, a number of the articles. So I forget, you know, articles one through four maybe are grouped as a bunch. And so much like last year, moderator will read them, um, uh, you know, and people would have the opportunity to object and speak about any one of them. But in the absence of an objection, we'll do, we'll adopt articles one through four with one vote instead of four. Um, we have another big block 
articles, I forget, 10 through 18 or something like that. So the meeting ought to move relatively expeditiously. Um, but the wastewater is the primary focus of the meeting. We've tried to keep it a relatively clean and um, uh, non-controversial for other matters so that people could focus on this. Um, if people are interested in the details, uh, I would encourage you to go to the town of Mashpee's website. We've, uh, we've developed a number of one-page discussions, a page on the details of the finance plan, a page on the details of the facility, a page on uh, what the cost to connect and the impact for the individual ratepayer might be who utilizes the system on a fee-for-service basis, uh, a series of frequently asked questions. And then we held four uh, recorded sessions, um, again, talking about how we pay for it, the facility, what's at stake environmentally and economically. Those are replaying. I think they're available on the MTV site. Um, they're available on the Mashby site. They're available on our, M our Facebook page. So a lot of information available. And to keep things moving, we'd encourage people to avail themselves of those resources um, so that you come to town meeting as educated as possible about what you're being asked to do, and we can move the meeting along. And obviously, not to short circuit conversation, but to have the conversation at town meeting be as informed as it possibly can so we're not starting from square one, uh, explaining the overall uh, impact of the project. So um, I would encourage folks to look at those resources. We will provide hard copies of those items to voters as they come to town meeting. Along with your warrant book, you'll be handed uh, those three or four one-page pieces so that people will have the information in front of them as we're discussing it during the presentation of the project so that people will be able to follow along in a little bit easier fashion. But pre-reading those would be helpful. Um, and then lastly, I would offer, um, anybody has a question, go on the town website, Send an email, direct it to me, I'll answer your question. I've been doing this hours a day for days on end. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, we might as well finish with a flourish. So, um, you know, we're happy to, to answer questions. So, with that, maybe I'll stop. I don't know how long I rattled on for, but I'm happy to answer other questions that you might have about conduct of town government or town meeting. Uh, but first of all, I just want to say, uh, Thank you very much for coming. I understand this so much better than I really did. I want to say that Marsha and I will be coming to town meeting. We'll be looking forward to being on the tent. Those votes are all going to be by just hand votes. I, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So the, the town meeting vote, you know, um, most of the town meeting will be able to be just by voice vote majority. You know, it's a moderated discretion as to whether the body has voted in favor or not. With a borrowing that requires a two-thirds, unless it's unanimous, and people say, you know, there's no objection, it will most likely be a raised hand count. Yeah. It would seem to me we'd be shooting ourselves in the foot if we would say no on this project. If anybody actually listens to the information that's there, it just seems like a, like a no-brainer to me. I, I'm glad you think that. Uh, um, and, you know, I've been spending the last several months making that case. As I said, I know there's some people out there who are opposed to the project. I cannot explain what their opposition is rooted in. Um, but, you know, this is a circumstance, you know, I, I've been on the board now seven years as my, this, you know, I've had, I had two term, two sets of elected office experiences in my life. Back in the late 80s, I was a selectman. And I got like 25 years off for good behavior, and then I fell back into it. And yeah, I've been trying to get us to this point for these last seven years. And you know, a project of this scale and scope has the potential, not properly done, to overwhelm the financial financial well-being of a community. And we've worked on this for a number of years. The legislature has been very good to the CAPE by providing us a number of different tools. The zero interest thing, um, the water infrastructure fund, um, all that, that is generally available. But the zero interest thing and the CAPE and Islands Water Protection Trust Fund, those are CAPE only. Other communities off in Massachusetts outside of Cape Cod do not have these financial tools available to them. 
legislature has given us these tools um, because they recognize that we were in a particularly fragile area and the cost we were experiencing uh, was so significant that it would hurt the well-being of the communities. So with the advent of these new tools, I think what you've seen is um, the town leadership from a financial perspective, the Board of Selectmen and the Finance Committee, unanimously in support of this project. And I've been used to, in the last seven years, being the only one in support of this project. Um, and now all of a sudden, I think people have gotten comfortable that the tools that we're using to finance this are not speculative, they're real. That the town did qualify for the loan, that's real. That the trust fund did happen, that's real. They did invest, they did award us with $13 million, that's real. It's not just my word for it anymore, but the fact is actions have been taken at the state and regional level that have changed the financial picture of this, com of this project and its impact on the community in a meaningful enough way that the lead financial leadership of the community can look at our voters and say, there is no basis not to proceed with this. We have to do this project. We know we have to do it. We've known we needed to do this for decades. We just couldn't figure out how to do it. Um, and now the science is resolved, the engineering is resolved, um, and the finances are resolved beyond a reasonable doubt to anyone who's being fair-minded about it. And we're all ready to proceed. So on Monday night, we're voting on phase one only? Is phase one right? only. Okay. And this, I'm a little, a little confused. I confuse easily these days. But so what will, what will phase one, how far will this go? You set out uh, the highways and so on. How far will this the phase one take? Basically, this, this covers the area. The treatment plant that's being built um, is large enough to service future uh, parts of the town. Okay. It's modular. Okay. So we will be able to add capacity onto the main building over time in future. So we're building the guts of the system, whether we stop at phase one or proceed further. Um, and then it will collect and treat the wastewater from the homes immediately adjacent to the landfill, that general area. Um, across 28, down Quinnequisset Avenue, down Mashby Neck. Okay. Okay. Um, it doesn't go over as far as Willowbend. It doesn't go south too far. It stops around the beginning of the Mashby River Woodlands as a general idea of what the coverage area is. Future phases, phase two would expand that catchment area um, east and south a little bit, and would also start to work on the other side of town to begin to fix the conditions that we experience in Wakoit Bay. And um, that future phase, when we do bring it to town, is probably a couple years, three to four years out before that's at the stage that this phase is at. So there's going to be a breathing room. We're going to see how the whole thing goes. Even if we vote on Monday and then ratify on Saturday, following on the 8th, um, we would go to bid in November. Construction would not commence until the spring of 22. System would not be complete until sometime in 2024. People will have a period of time to connect. So the system won't be up functioning and making a meaningful difference until 2025. It's a very protracted timeline to move these projects from conception to implementation to see them have an effect. And so, you know, none of us are getting any younger. You know, we like to see some result of this. We need to get started. <laughs> and we won't start paying debt service back on this till sometime in 25 or 26. This doesn't even hit our books for four or five years. Think about my age and adding up these years as well, too. But now, another question: I'm a member of the Formal Housing Committee, so I kind of have some uh, comprehension about the delay and the, all the time it takes to do these things. But New Seabury has got this huge project going down on 
there now? Do they have a, a separate They have their own facility. So this, they're not connected to this facility. It has no impact on us. No. I went down to the old church, and then in a while at church, and that whole area, yeah. I could not believe the size of that area has been cleared. Unbelievable number of units. That must be yeah, no, the, uh, you know, there, what a lot of people don't realize is there are a dozen or so privately owned wastewater treatment plants in the town of Mashpee now. And Seabury has one, Willow Bend has one, Southport has one, Stratford Ponds has one, Mashpee Commons has one. Um, and those all treat to a higher level than the septic system I own in my house. So they are doing more than the norm in the town. And they are also functioning within these communities in a way that is inobtrusive to the residents of those communities. I don't get complaints about odors, noise, anything from anybody who lives in any of these development areas that are treat serviced by wastewater treatment facilities. And our facility will be more modern, more highly designed, and more technologically advanced than theirs. So, you know, we have, a, we have actual reason to believe that this will, once the construction is done um, and that disruption is over, that this will become something that is largely unnoticed and forgotten and it'll just do its job. There's only two members of the Ministry of Men's Club here this morning, but I'm going to ask Berkeley Johnson to send a notice out to our 70 members or whatever that is suggesting that they should really, if they're Mastery residents, they should really make an effort to come to town meeting on the... On Monday, in the, in and and yeah. bring their and bring their friends. And bring their friends, and uh, you know, because they're and go on the Mashpee Town website, take a look at things. I mean, if they need more information, the information, look that over. But please try to come on Monday night. Yeah, we you know the town. We did a smart thing, uh, which was we hired a professional writer to take everything that I just spilled out at you and write it concisely, <laughs> and so it is very accessible. Um, and easily, I believe, easily understood, and sort of a you know, a very high quality product that provides the in, that just provides information. It doesn't provide in, in opinions. It just provides information. And so uh, you know, those are available. And as I said, those will be available at town meeting. Chris, Andy, you said earlier if somebody wanted to get a paper ballot, they could go to town hall as one of the options. Town hall is closed. Right. You can contact the clerk's office and they can leave one. There's a table outside or they can mail you one. I just wanted people to know what that process would yeah. be. Yeah, so there's the ability to, to access those. And obviously, you know, the mail can be slow these days. <laughs> um, so, you know, don't leave it. Don't decide on Friday that you want an early voting ballot. You know, this year's early voting is different than last year's early voting. You can't actually go in and physically vote in the clerk's office. You have to file the application, get the ballot from the clerk, fill it out. You can drop it off anytime. You know, there's a little uh, silver drop box to the right of the main door of town hall. That's a secure location. You can use it to do any number of transactions with the town. But you can drop your ballot. And I would encourage you to drop your ballot in that box rather than put a stamp on it and take your chances with the post office. Um, but we can vote actually on town meeting day. That's, that's you can vote. You can physically vote at the Quashton School on uh, May eighth, Saturday, May eighth, from seven in the morning to eight at night. And that 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 vote is that exclusion only. Yeah, yeah that that ballot that ballot has a number of different questions on it. All the typical elected offices that involve the town. The only contested race at the moment is the board of selectmen race, and question one. Everybody, all the other candidacies on that ballot are uncontested, or f there's fewer people than there are slots. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so you can physically go to the ele to vote on the eighth at Quashton School, seven in the morning to eight at night. That's what I'm going to do. Um, or you can do it early. The important thing is you do it. And early would be the, the, the entire vote. Or it would be the entire ballot. The entire ballot. So yes. Not the, one thing. not the one thing. You get the entire ballot, just as if you were to go. Yeah. You yeah. fill it out. You obviously are at your discretion what you choose to vote on. Uh, but you would get the whole ballot, and that would be your one shot.
wastewater problem has been around Massachusetts for a long time, particularly yep. eastern Massachusetts. One of the interesting studies that is ongoing at the university level at this time um, it is that it didn't seem reasonable to take sewer water, you pump the water out of the ground, run it through the house, run it through a treatment plant, and poke it out into the ocean through a river or something. Yep. And they're saying, no, that's not reasonable because now you're taking the water and playing with it. Yep. So it's less appropriate here because you get influx to your water tables from uh, the ocean, et cetera. But what they're looking at is ways of being able to put the water, clean water, back in the ground. That's what we are doing, is we'll be taking, collecting that dirty wastewater, running it through a series of physical filtration systems to take out the, it's not good dinner talk, take out the solids, um, and then put a, you know, those come out at the front end, then it goes into you know a series of biologically based tanks. We're using bacteria and bugs to eat up and break down that waste. It then gets purified through a third stage of treatment. It gets disinfected through the use of ultraviolet light, so we're not introducing chlorine and, and sanitizing compounds into the environment. And then it get that clean water, which will effectively meet drinking water standards, is then discharged to the ground. It infiltrates back into the ground, and it serves as recharge to the Mashpee River, uh, bring fresh water, clean water back into that river system as it moves south um, and ultimately into Popnesset Bay. So we'll be replacing um, you know, waters that are laden with compounds. Nutrients is our focus, but there's all sorts of other stuff in wastewater. Uh, you know, whatever you put down the drain, ends up in our water. Whatever you ingest as medication, process and excrete through your body, ends up in the waste stream. So these trans centralized treatment facilities, you know, provide us the ability to remove those compounds as we learn more about their presence so that they're not distributed out ubiquitously through the environment. So there's a lot of benefit to it. There has been talk about discharging to the ocean. I don't like it. Um, you know, it doesn't make any sense. You know, our, our entire water table is based on precipitation leaching its way into the ground. Taking all that water and pulling it out of that system and dumping it in the ocean um, will bring our overall water levels down. You know, our ponds and our rivers are reflections of how high the water table is. Our vernal pools, on which a lot of spring lifetime, amphibious lifetime relies, are reflections of the overall height of the groundwater. You start pumping tons of water or millions of gallons of water a year out of the system, bypassing the natural world and putting it in the ocean. You bring the water table down, you'll have huge impacts on that natural system functioning. Um, and so it makes no sense. The other thing is, if you discharge into the ocean, you tend to get lazy. It's a way. Right? And so eh, we don't have to spend as much money to treat to this high level because we're just putting it in the ocean. Our oceans are under enormous stress and strain. Um, and so, you know, the notion here is let's treat our waste to the level where it's benign to the environment and discharge it close. Because what's close, we pay attention to sometimes. What's far away, out of sight, out of mind. Randy is a resident engineer, so I'm glad that he's here today. He, he kind of keeps us on task here. Also, just not about straightforward fertilizer on my lawn. If we fertilize the lawn. Don't do it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know. Like you said, uh, uh, one of the things that I was involved in was the water treatment facility on the space station. Okay. You got to use, you got to, you got every drop counts, every right? Every drop of water gets reprocessed to drinking water levels. Right. Every drop. Right. So we have focused in this discussion on the nutrient load that comes from uh, septic. And for Mashpee in general and southeastern facing, south facing Cape Cod, about 85% of the nitrogen load that's impactful on our estuaries comes from wastewater. The other 15%, about two thirds of that is fertilizer. The other 5%, you know, from road stormwater runoff. 
Um, in a freshwater environment, I don't have the same, there isn't the same level of data out there. I suspect that lawn application of fertilizers is a little bit higher percentage of the phosphorus load than you're seeing on the marine side. Um, but the basic premise is a green lawn gets you a green pond. All right? It, you know, there's a whole nother discussion to be had about what landscaping is appropriate for the aquatic environment in which we live. So, you know, and I can talk for another hour about, you know, not trying to bring to Cape Cod what you might have had uh, in your suburban prior life in terms of the lush green putting green lawn. Um, because our soils don't support it. So if you're going to put that in, you're going to water the hell out of it, you're going to fertilize it, you're probably going to apply herbicides and pesticides on it, and all those things end up in your water. And so, you know, back off the fertilizing, um, you know, use native species of plants that are acclimated to and accustomed to our permeable, dry, low nutrient soils. Um, don't strip your yard landscape down to the water's edge. Have a natural buffer of vegetation between your yard and the water to help take those nutrients up before they end up in the water. Um, and you really have to think about, is it worth it? Do you want to, you know, we put down millions of pounds of fertilizers. You can't walk into a garden center or a hardware store without the first thing in your face this time of year being fertilizers, herbicides, and pesticides. Um, and unless you want to eat it, drink it, and swim in it, you might want to think about not using it. Um, you can't solve our problem by eliminating the use of those compounds, but you can make a dent, and you can do it at almost no cost. Rather than spending money on these chemicals, you can not spend the money on those chemicals. You can convert your yard over a native species. You can adopt, you know, just even limit your land, even limit your lawn space. You want something green? That's fine. But the whole yard doesn't have to be manicured to the same level. The whole yard doesn't need to be treated to the same level. Um, you will cost effectively be doing a good thing for the environment. And as we move to begin to think about our freshwater ponds, remember, every one of Mashpee's major freshwater ponds, Mashpee, Wakeby, Santuit, Ashumit, and Johns Pond, all had cyanobacteria closures last year um, because of the toxicity that comes from that algae form. That's being driven by nutrients. It's different than the marine side. In some respects, it's worse because it has toxicity associated with it. And, you know, that's being driven in a significant fashion by lawn care practices, lawn care products. Um, and there's a lot people can do in the short term when we come up with a strategy to deal with our freshwaters to minimize the impact of their property activities on the freshwater ponds. And that's just a stop of the fertilization. Mm -hmm. um, is dumping. Yep. We had one instance back on our piece um, where we had somebody dump two five-gallon pails, just left them there, of used pool chemicals uphill from a vernal pool. Uh, we got it taken care of, and hopefully we've eliminated that source right. now. But, um, I mean, at the end of the day, there's got to be some individual responsibility to put in gates and everything else to keep people out of there. But even with the gates, you know, and gates are a double-edged sword. You know, yeah. gates limit people's, I mean, we, you know, we've, the town of Mashpee's had an enormous amount of foresight in putting about 42% of our land mass in, in conservation restriction. Um, but, you know, gates prevent people from accessing those properties. Things that people can't access and utilize, they don't value. So, you know, it's important to be able to, have people out in the natural world has been never been more important than it's been the last 14 months under the pandemic conditions. Our recreational resources, our open spaces, have never seen more use than they have in the last year as people become in touch with it. And yet, 
you know, you pick your favorite spot, I'll pick my favorite spot, and there's more garbage out there than there ever has been before as well. And at some point, you know, people need to just, you know, behave in a better manner. You can't legislate decency. Um, and we don't have the manpower to be out there of eyes on all trails. But yeah, you know, that kind of dumping is, is a real problem. Great. Any more questions, Jermaine? No. Thank you very much. Great. Uh, that was a great job. Great all right, I appreciate it. And uh, get out and vote. We will. We will. <laughs>